All right, back on the Young Turks. Um, now, uh, let me tell you about a, quick, a couple of quick things before we go on with the show. Um, I got a fun new announcement that I should have done more dramatically. It needs a little bit of... Well, there, I just did it. Okay, uh, hello, TYT Road Trips. What is this? Um, these are road trips we're organizing with legendary Perillo tours. Uh, there's one coming up November 8th through 12th. It's the first one. Uh, go to tytnetwork.com slash trip and find out all about it. It's a trip that I already did with Dave Kohler, Steve O, and some of my other friends. Uh, it's basically a civil rights trip. It starts in the Civil Rights Museum where MLK was assassinated. It goes through Graceline, Johnny Cash's house, the Clinton Presidential Library. It's just a phenomenal trip. And one little fun extra surprise. Supplies! Someone from TYT goes on the trip. But you don't know who. You could only hope that Bart shows up with his shorts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll talk more about that as uh, life goes on. And, uh, obviously, you know to fix your face with Squarespace. Okay. So, uh, now let's move forward. Here we go. Here we go again with Oklahoma. Uh, we've got Representative John Bennett now. He's a United, former United States Marine Corps reservist. He is a state representative there. He's, of course, a Republican. And he's, of course, against uh, Muslims. Now, not just uh, Muslim extremists, all Muslims. He's going to explain. He put up a Facebook post saying, Islam and Muslim are one and the same. They are adjectives describing their religion. Islam is the religion, Muslim is the person that follows Islam. So far, that's 100% correct. If someone claims to be Muslim, they subscribe to Islam, the Quran. The Quran clearly states that non-Muslims should be killed. Arab is the ethnicity, not Muslim or Islam. Be wary of the individuals who claim to be Muslim American. Be especially wary if you're a Christian. Now, what's interesting about that is the things that are correct in there for no reason. Like, he's like, and then between A and C, we have the letter B. And because of that, be wary of anyone that starts with the letter B in their name at all. So if you see Bob, say wrong again, Bob. Why? Because it is between A and C. So he's like, okay, if you're Muslim, that means you follow Islam, correct? Doesn't necessarily mean you're an Arab, and not all Arabs are Muslims. And by the way, the Muslims are dangerous, and watch out for them. <laughs> okay, so the premise is, uh, no, 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 it's because the Quran says it. So if the Quran says it in any place, then everyone in that religion is guilty. That's very interesting. Hold that thought. Okay. Now, of course, the Council on Isla American Islamic Relations, uh, otherwise known as CARE, which is the largest uh, Muslim American group, was a little aggrieved about this, and they reached out to him and said, come on, that's ridiculous. There's millions of Mo Muslim Americans. They're law-abiding, and to say that they're all dangerous and want to kill Christians is insane, right? And so, of course, we're going to have an apology. Wrong! We're not going to have an apology. John Bennett then says on his Facebook account, so the Council on American Islamic Relations is reading my Facebook and demanding an apology for what I said. Well, since you're monitoring my Facebook, I will not apologize to you. He capitalized, will not. I know you, who you are, and what you represent, and I'm watching you closely. Well, then it sounds like you're the creeper, <laughs> okay? Uh, what you, they're a civil rights group. What are they, like, but you see, in John Bennett's mind, all Muslims are guilty. And you got to watch all of them closely, all millions of them here in the country who are citizens just like John Bennett, who have all the exact rights that John Bennett does, who are just as American as John Bennett is. But John Bennett said, no, they're Muslims. you got to watch out for them. And well, that would almost be the definition of bigotry. All right. So he goes on to say things like this. We must shine a bright light on the role of Muslim Brotherhood and its very tentacles in the U.S. Okay, go for it, big guy. Uh, if there really was Muslim Brotherhood inside the government, I would want to shine a light on it. I would be fascinated by that, and I would be worried about that. There is no such thing. You, I mean, conservatives have shined as bright a light as they could possibly find, and they can't name a single person. There is no Muslim Brotherhood inside the U.S. government. That's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Oh, yeah, they're taking over, and soon they're going to have Sharia law in Oklahoma. Yeah, all right, maybe if you're mental, that makes sense. But these people are paranoid. They're like, the Muslims, the Muslims, watch out here, they come, oh, Sharia law, Muslim brother, I'm so scared. <laughs> More from John Bennett. Our borders are wide open to drug and human traffickers. 
terrorism could come to Oklahoma just as easily. <laughs> okay, so combining the two issues, Obama's not closing the border, build a wall, build a giant wall. Oh, God damn it, the terrorists are this close to Oklahoma City. Actually, there was a terrorist in Oklahoma City, if you remember, and he was not Muslim. Okay, so uh, now you think, of course, this guy's gonna get denounced because this kind of blanket statement against so many Americans is ridiculous, obviously outrageous, right? So uh, Dave Weston, the party chairman for the Republicans in Oklahoma, the party chairman, steps in and regulates. And he says, CARE's request for an apology was disingenuous at best. If we as Americans were ruled by Islam, then Christians and Jews like you and I could only keep practicing our faith if we paid a protection tax. And he says, otherwise, we would be killed. So even the Republican chairman in Oklahoma is like, nope, nope. We believe all Muslim Americans are guilty by definition. I, I wonder why Muslims might not support the Republican Party if they're American citizens here. I can't quite tell. All right. So, um, by the way, if you said this about Jews, you know, all the Jews are guilty, right? All Jewish Americans, by definition, are guilty. I'm sure it would go over great. Or if you said it about Christians or almost anyone else. But no one's resigned, no one's apologized. They keep on going. Now, Let's go to those holy texts that they talk about. Now, is there, uh, are there uh, places in the Quran where they talk about killing the infidels? Yes, there are. Okay, that's why I don't believe in the religions. I think they're nutty. Okay. Uh, now, on the other hand, did, the Mo did Muhammad say this as well? Yes. Uh, let's take a look. This is a message from Muhammad ibn Abdullah. This is from 1,400 years ago, of course, Prophet Muhammad, who started uh, Islam. As a covenant to those who adopt Christianity near and far, we are with them. Verily I, the servants, the helpers, and my followers defend them, because Christians are my citizens, and by God, I hold out against anything that displeases them. No compulsion is to be on them, neither are their judges to be removed from their jobs, nor their monks from their monasteries. No one is to destroy a house of their religion, to damage it, or to carry anything from it to the Muslims' houses. Should anyone take any of these, he would spoil God's covenant and disobey his prophet. Verily, they are my allies and have my secure charter against all that they hate. No one is to force them to travel or to oblige them to fight. The Muslims are to fight for them. If a female Christian is married to a Muslim, it is not to take place without her approval. She is not to be prevented from visiting her church to pray. Their churches are declared to be protected. They are neither to be prevented from repairing them nor the sacredness of their covenants. No one of the nation of Muslims is to disobey the covenant to the last day. Now, is that contradictory to another part of the Quran? Yes. Uh, are you surprised by that? If you are, you haven't studied any of the religions. All of the religions are wildly contradictory. But here is a very clear passage from the prophet Muhammad that says you must protect the Christians. And so you understand the context of this. Islam considers itself the third book, the Old Testament, the New Testament, then the Quran. So Islam considers all three of those religions to be legitimate and they are people of the book, okay? And they just feel that Muhammad was the last prophet. They believe it that in Jesus Christ, they believe Jesus Christ was a prophet of God. Okay, now I'm sure knuckleheads like this Bennett guy in Oklahoma has no idea about that. But they do, that's why there are passages in the Quran that says protect the Christians at all costs. Now, the good Christians in Oklahoma and elsewhere, uh, and certainly in the Republican Party, might say, hey, you know what? At least there's none of that stuff in the Bible. It only talks about good and loving and caring. And are there passages in the Bible where Jesus says protect non-believers? Yes, there are. Now let me read you another passage from the Bible. Go to Deuteronomy 17. If a man or woman living among you in one of the towns the Lord gives you is found doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, your God in violation of his covenant, and contrary to my command has worshipped other gods, bowing down to them or to the sun or the moon or the stars in the sky, and this has been brought to your attention, then you must investigate it thoroughly. If it is true and it has been proved that this detestable thing has been done in Israel, take the man or woman who has done this evil deed to your city gate and stone that person to death. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person is to be put to death, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. 
the hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting that person to death and then the hands of all the people, you must purge evil from among you. There it is, it's in the Bible, clear as can possibly be. If you worship to anything other than the God in the Bible, we shall stone you to death. Now, come to find out, I've got all these Christians here in America I gotta watch out for. If it's in your Bible, I mean, the fundamentalists tell me we are to take the literal word of God, Every word in the Bible is correct. Now, oftentimes they'll cop out and say, well, I mean, Jesus changed some of the, 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 changed the Old Testament. Oh, he did, so the Old Testament's not in effect anymore. Jesus changed all that. How about Adam and Eve? That was in the Old Testament. How about Noah? He's in the Old Testament. How about most of your creation myths? They're in the Old Testament. And if we tell you about that creationism is wrong, you go, oh, no way, it's in the Bible, it's in the Bible. It's right there. It says Adam and Eve and Noah and all the things that happened. All Old Testament, Deuteronomy here, clearly says, if they pray to anyone but your God, stone them to death. I'm really scared to death about the Christians. By definition, according to Bennett's ideology and apparently the ideology of the entire Republican Party in Oklahoma, based on their chairman, we have to be worried about the Christians. They're all murderers. They're all vicious murderers, and they will kill anyone that does not believe in Christianity. Now, is that really true? Of course not, right? Is it true of 1.6 billion Muslims across the world? Of course not. But you see, you would understand that if you had a brain and you could actually reason like a human being. But if you want to spread bigotry throughout the country and throughout the world, instead you would simplify things and say, oh, I got a piece of text, I got a piece of text. They're all bad. The Muslims are the bad guys. We got to go get them before they get us. Well, they, Muslim Americans are not they, they're not outsiders, they're Americans, just as American as you are. And you don't get to judge them on that. And by the way, you know who decided that? Guys named Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, etc. Our founding fathers, they put it in the Constitution. There should be no religious test for office. You should have free exercise of religion, not Christianity, of any religion. So... If you don't believe in that, and you want to discriminate against a particular religion, and as you can tell, I got no love for any of the religions, okay? But I believe in our Constitution. And if you want to discriminate against any of those religions, well then ironically, that makes you un-American. All right, now, let's go back to goofy stories. This guy's uh, an interesting fellow here, okay. Fascinating story coming out of Ohio. A guy named uh, Chris Haben. He's an ex-Navy SEAL. And boy, did he go through some stuff, man. Oof. This guy's an American hero. Wait till you hear the story. Chris Haben, a 44-year-old former Navy SEAL who served from 1996 through 2006, told police in Bath Township that he was almost hit by a low-profile sports car in a grocery store parking lot in Akron on March 28th. He said that there were three black men in the car and that they shouted obscenities at him. And then he goes on to explain, he went back inside the store because he forgot his wallet there, and he comes back out, and he's confronted by these three racist black guys again, and apparently this is what they shout at him. They tell him, you got a big mouth, white boy. You need to learn some fucking respect. And then they shot him in the abdomen. Wow, that is terrible. Look at those racist black guys. And they just shoot a poor white guy for doing nothing. It's an American hero. Now, um, Ross story continue, continues to explain. According to Heben's story, he plugged the bullet hole and tried to chase the men down in his car until he began to lose consciousness, so he stopped at a fire station for help. Now, if I had heard this story, if I didn't already think it was bullshit, that's the point where I'd be like, really? So you got shot in the app at me, you're like, I got it. All right, let's go. All right, I'm going to get these sons of bitches. All right, here we go, here we go. Hmm, this doesn't feel too good. Okay, oh, oh, look at these racist black guys I ran across. They shot me, but it's okay. I plugged it up, and I started running after them. So did uh, CNN and Fox News show skepticism toward that? Of course not. He was on both channels as an American hero. They're like, oh, your heroism and your courage is overwhelming. What did these poor black people do to you? Now, here's the problem for Chris Haven. The cops actually did their job here. 
And they're like, oh, okay, great. Let's look at some videotape and we'll find out who did it and we'll get the sons of bitches and we're going to here to help you, right? And they go to the parking lot he said the altercation happened in and they're like, hmm, wait a minute here. Uh, here is a quote from Mike McNeely, Bath Township Police Chief. We have overwhelming evidence based upon video, cell phone records, and interviews that the shooting did not occur in the West Market Plaza and that Mr. Haben made false allegations to us. Turns out that uh, the story ain't true. All you had to do was look a little bit into it and you would find out that that is the case. In fact, he's now been charged with a first-degree misdemeanor for giving false information to a police and a second-degree misdemeanor for obstructing official police business. He could serve up to 180 days in jail. When uh, McNeely, the police chief, was asked about who shot him, he's like, you're going to have to ask him, man. <laughs> I don't know who shot him or under what circumstances that happened because the only guy who knows is him, but his official story ain't true. Now, I, I don't know either, obviously. I wasn't there. But either it was somebody that he didn't want to talk about, a mistress, something, I have no idea, right? My best guess is the idiot shot himself accidentally. And, he, and then he wants to be a hero. Or maybe he did it on purpose. Who knows? We'd have to ask him, but he's probably going to lie about it, right? So he, the idiot shoots himself in the abdomen, plugs it up, and then he's like, oh, my God, the black guys! The black guys did it! It was three of them, and they were shouting racial things at me. Turns out, by the way, uh, that he does at least some level of lying uh, fairly regularly. WKYC reported that Haben had a previous conviction for three counts of forgery related to prescriptions of controlled substances. Okay, just another day in America, and uh, be, look, cops did a great job here. Credit to the cops, right? But because of the lies, what do they have to do? First, they got to go look for three. Black guys in a sports car, low profile sports car, they're gonna search the whole town looking for those guys while they'll go get the videotape, etc. And then black guys all across get town uh, across town get harassed, and the cycle goes on and on because of assholes like he. I throw I, I mean 180 days, I'm not sure that does it. Okay. They should throw the book at him, and I'm glad the police did a great job of investigating and figuring out what really was true in that case. Okay. Now, a little bit later in the program, we're going to have a story, just actually one story later, about how the police did not do a good job in another case. Um, but hey, that's life. Okay. So, uh, one quick story here from uh, about politics. There's a group called Moms Demand uh, Action for Gun Sense. Uh, they're for gun control, uh, and Mike Bloomberg supports this group. And uh, they did a program to try to make sure that uh, you couldn't bring weapons into Target. That was successful. So they're now doing it with Kroger, which is actually the second largest chain behind Walmart in America. And Kroger allows for you to bring weapons into, your, into the store if it complies with local and state laws. And now guns, uh, mom, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense wants to change that. So they've started running ads. I want to show you the ads because they're... Well, they're striking, and it's hard to not see their point. I, we'll see. I mean, maybe some gun rights advocates think this makes sense. So here are three of the ads that they're running. The first one, they say, uh, as you can see here, one of them isn't welcome, welcome at Kroger. Guess which one? Now, every one of them says that. In this case, you see a guy, of course, with a, uh, a rifle and a kid with a skateboard. Of course, the correct answer is the skateboard is not allowed at Kroger. That's dangerous whereas that assault rifle is perfectly allowed. Isn't that unbelievable? Gets worse. Here's another one. <laughs> Ice cream eaten by little girls <laughs> or by anyone is not allowed at Kroger. But an automatic weapon or semi-automatic, I don't know what those are, I don't care, I don't want to be around any of them, is allowed. Can you imagine you got your kid there and they throw you out because she's eating ice cream, but they will let her walk next to that guy holding an assault rifle? Insanity. And then one last one. Of course, you need a shirt to be in Kroger. So the woman with the assault rifle, uh, perfectly allowed. The dude without the shirt has to go. On that one, I kind of agree. <laughs> I might rather be next to her than him. <laughs> He's really got to put a shirt on. Okay. I'm not judging, brother. I might look like the same. That's why I put on a shirt when I go to Kroger. And I also leave my weapons, my non-existent weapons, at home. Okay. 
This is crazy, man. This is much worse than the OK Corral, much worse than anything we had in the Wild Wild West. In fact, at the OK Corral, we had a shootout because normally you had to turn your weapons in when you came into town. Forget going into the grocery store. The minute you entered the towns in the Wild Wild West, you had to turn your weapons in in most of the towns. The OK Corral happened because somebody refused to turn their weapons in. Okay? In this case, you can have them all over town. You can have them at Kroger. You're going to have them anywhere you like. Just don't bring any ice cream because that's dangerous. It's crazy. All right. Now, we go to the unfortunate story. God, time is too short. All right. Now, now let me tell you a story about, unfortunately, 30 years of injustice. Uh, this happens to be in North Carolina. Uh, two uh, fellows uh, were in jail. Not just in jail, one of them was on death row. Henry Lee McCollum, who's 50, spent three decades on death row. And Leon Brown, who's his brother, who's 46, was serving a life sentence. Well, now, when you find out why they were sentenced, you might think that it makes sense. They uh, confessed to a crime, it was a brutal crime, a rape of a young girl, 11 years old, and then she was strangled with her own bra and left to die. It's just horrible, right? Now, the story's a little more complicated than that. Because what we're going to have to keep in mind is, if a crime is brutal, that doesn't mean you have the right guys. Okay. So now, we pick it up from the New York Times. 30 years after their convictions, in the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl in rural North Carolina, based on confessions that they quickly repudiated and said were coerced, two mentally disabled half-brothers were declared innocent and ordered to release Tuesday by a judge here. Now... Understand that they were mentally disabled throughout. Okay, they have the intelligence of about a nine-year-old. So uh, McCullum was pressured for five hours, screamed at. He said it was pressure like I'd never had in my entire life. I didn't understand it. He signed the confession, signed the confession. We'll tell you what he did in a second, okay, uh, in terms of, uh, of that confession issue. But let me continue here. This is Jonathan M. Katz and Eric Elkholm for the New York Times. The case against the men, always weak, fell apart after DNA evidence implicated another man whose possible involvement had been somehow overlooked by the authorities, even though he lived only a block from where the victim's body was found, and he had admit admitted to committing a similar rape and murder around the same time. Isn't that amazing? Turns out it's a guy who lived a block from the girl who was raped and killed. He had done similar crimes before. In fact, he got arrested a couple of weeks later for raping another girl in the neighborhood. They didn't bother looking into that, okay? We already have our confession. Here, let me tell you more about the guy who actually did it, and it turned out it was his DNA. Uh, officials never explained why, despite the remarkable similarities in the crimes, they kept their focus on Mr. McCollum and Mr. Brown, even as the main men proclaimed their innocence. Well, that one's fairly easy to explain. I can tell you why. Because as soon as they got the confession, they're like, who cares, right or wrong? We got our guys. I don't want extra work. Then I'm going to have to say I was wrong and I pressured the wrong guys mentally disabled guys into a wrong confession. Well, that wouldn't look good on my record. So let's just prosecute them and kill them. Let's give them a death sentence. Cops, prosecutors, who cares? Well, there's a guy right next door who also raped another girl. Can you look into her? No, 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 we already got the confession. We already pressured them into it. So how did that happen? Well, they browbeat McCollum for uh, five straight hours. They yell at him. He's never experienced anything like this in his life. And they explain, after Henry McCollum signed a statement written in longhand by the investigators, he asked, can I go home now? The guy is mentally disabled. He couldn't even write it out. It's not clear that he could even read it. They write it out for him. They have him sign it. It's so obvious he doesn't understand it because he's like, okay, good, I signed it now. Can I go home? He thinks he can go home after he signs it. And the sons of bitches in the room are like, ha ha, we got him. What did you get? All right, now let me tell you uh, what happened to his brother, Mr. Brown. Before the night was done, Mr. Brown, after being told that his half-brother had confessed and facing similar threats that he could be executed if he did not cooperate, also signed a confession. By the way, one was uh, 19 at the time, and uh, the other one was 15. They tell a 15-year-old, again, disabled, and they say, you're going to get executed. You're going to get executed unless you sign this thing. And then what does he do? He signs. And then they're like, boom. Job well done. Everybody go home. And you guys go on death row. They were both on death row initially. There was an appeal. And then McCollum stayed on death row after the appeal. And Brown uh, got a life sentence. It actually went all the way to the Supreme Court. What happened there? 
Well, let's explain. In 1994, when the United States Supreme Court turned on a request to review the case, Justice Antonin Scalia described Mr. McCollum's crime as so heinous that it would be hard to, against, hard to argue against lethal injection. Now, Scalia thinks he's such a genius, and he's always putting down the other justices and writing this flowery language. Oh, please, if you realize. You knucklehead, you idiot. It's not the heinousness of the crime that's the issue. It's whether they did it or not. That's why they're appealing. They're not appealing saying, ah, the crime wasn't so bad. <laughs> Nobody says that. They've never said that. They said the crime is terrible. You should get the guy who did it and not the guys who didn't do it. And Scalia is like, ah, crime's terrible. Let's kill him. But kill who? Kill the wrong guys? Well, it's, of course, the huge problem with the death penalty that people like Scalia will not recognize. I used to be in favor of the death penalty, but I understood because of DNA evidence that it turns out a lot of the guys didn't do it, like these two brothers. How can we sit here and go, ah, screw it, let's take a chance. We know some of them didn't do it. We know they there's these horrible convictions. Let's kill them all anyway. What kind of a person says that? I guess a person like Scalia. As recently as 2010, the North Carolina Republican Party put Mr. McCollum's booking photograph on campaign flyers that accuse a Democratic candidate of being soft on crime. Here, sh show me the second set of pictures again, Asus. That's graphic A, D, right? B. Um, they put these guys on posters and said, ha ha, look at that, we got them, but the Democrats would have been soft on them, and they, you know, it's, that's why they haven't executed them. Turns out they were innocent. Did the Republican Party apologize? Oh, sorry about that. We were tough on crime on the wrong guys. And we, in a sense, it's almost create, creating more crime. It's just more murder of the wrong people. We're still waiting on that apology from the North Carolina Republican Party. It has not been forthcoming yet. Um, now, finally, let's go to the prosecutor who prosecuted them in the first place. New York Times describes him this way. The two young defendants were prosecuted by Joe Freeman Britt, the six foot six Bible-quoting district attorney who was later profiled by 60 Minutes as the country's deadliest DA because he sought the death penalty so often. So, guy brags about it, reading the Bible as if he's moral, right? And he keeps quoting the Bible in court and he says, and I'm the deadliest DA. I kill you whether you're guilty or innocent. doesn't matter. I just kill you. You must be so proud, man. And that's what this is about. A lot of it is about pride. You should read that section in the Bible, by the way, Mr. Britt, about uh, pride. Because the idea is, I can't ever be wrong. If I convicted them, then they must be guilty. Who cares about DNA? Who cares about false confessions? Who cares that they're mentally disabled? Who cares that we pressured them into it? Who cares that the obvious guy who did it was right next to us? That guy, by the way, would oftentimes say, uh, I don't know who did it, but it definitely wasn't those two brothers. You've got a guy saying that. Will you look into it? No, because that would blemish his precious, precious career as a prosecutor. No, he's going to go quote the Bible to you anyway. Anyway, obviously in this case he's 100% wrong. That's why they let the guys out. So they asked him about it. Joe Freeman Britt, the original prosecutor, told the News and Observer last week that he still believed the men were guilty. <laughs> he still would have put them to death. He would have put McCollum to death, and he would have never let out Brown after 30 years of horrible, horrific injustice. Young Turks. That was a segment from hour one of the show. Now for the better hour, the second hour. Drums. You can get the whole show on TYTnetwork.com. The reason I was laughing during the break is somehow Bart dance has become a thing. I don't even know what it means, but it's taken on a life of its own. Um, so David Messer writes in, hashtag Bart dance, hashtag leprechaun, hashtag TYT live. I don't know what any of those words mean. <laughs> okay. And then uh, Kyle says, when a dancing Bart appears, good fortune will be had by all. What? <laughs> I, we've created an internet meme we don't even understand. <laughs> okay, so fa fascinating. There's actually a decent amount of love for um, 
for uh, Joan Rivers out there, mm -hmm. uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, no more donations probably summed it up best. I agree Joan Rivers' comments on Gaza were unwarranted, but if you take her whole career in perspective, I still will miss her. And then a lot of po people pointed out she was so harsh on so many things, so you got to take it in perspective. And, and right, I, I forgot to give you this joke by her. She said on Fashion Police, last time a German looked this hot was when they were pushing Jews into the ovens. That is, that's the craziest, harshest joke I've ever heard in my life, okay? Now, that's about our own folks. That makes me uncomfortable. Super uncomfortable. That's why I don't love it, right? It's not for me. Yeah. But at least she was an equal opportunity offender. No right. question about right. that, okay? She hated everyone. Yeah. Well, and, you know, she didn't hate them, but she yeah, was just yeah. over the top. Mm -hmm. um, Carissa Boucher says, thanks, Anna. I just changed my Facebook autoplay. Uh, Rob says, only the psychopaths want autoplay. John Connor just went nuclear. Uh, I've deleted Facebook Messenger app. Boom, gone. Instead of trying to figure out how to turn it on, he's like, just boom, delete, gone. I love okay. that. John sounds like me. And then finally, Skeletor Farnsworth says, old man Jay Guger needs help programming the VCR. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. Okay, oh, I gotta get read members. So, John, uh, you have no, I mean, Skeletor, you have no idea how right you are. Because in the post game, I'm gonna tell you two things. One is, my old VCR porn collection. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. So. Have you held on to it? Oh, I can't wait to hear about this. <laughs> okay. So the post game is, uh, it's going to be nuclear. Spetsnaz is going to be in the post game. <laughs> okay. Hey, don't make fun of Spetsnaz. Okay? okay. Sorry. Sorry. Didn't mean to offend the Spetsnaz. But you probably don't want to. They probably will fuck you up. <laughs> Anyways, also in the post game, how my wife screwed me over on the first day of uh, football. Mm. Mm. I like mm. that. This post game is going to be delicious. Yes. All right, member shout outs. Sean Welling is member number 2652. And uh, member number 493 is Anthony Layton. Sean and Anthony, we love you guys. Meetups on um, in Detroit, Orlando, and New Orleans coming up on Saturday, Monday, and Tuesday. Check out tytworld.com for that. And obviously, if you're going to build a website and you don't go to squarespace.com slash tyt, I will be really pissed. I will do nothing about it, but I will be pissed, okay? Fix your face with Squarespace. Mm -hmm. Next. All right. We have more crazy answers and advice from Pat Robertson. An 80-year-old woman called in and said, hey, you know what? I have been donating 10% of my income for a very, very long time toward tithing. I've been giving my money to my religion. And all of a sudden, she's been running into some financial issues. She's having a hard time paying for a car that's broken down. Uh, her family can't pay for some medical bills. And so she really wanted a piece of advice from Pat Robertson. Here's what he had to say. Why don't you ask God to show you some ways of making money? You know, there's, there are many ways of making money, even at 80 years old. Uh, you know, you can get on the telephone and people are hiring. Uh, there are all kinds of things you can do. Uh, think of ways, I mean, for example, you may have a bunch of junk lying around in your garage that you can uh, sell on eBay and get some money. I mean, there are many, many ways of making money. And um, you're, you, you're, you're looking at the downside of all the bills you've got. And, and instead of saying, God, uh, now I've been faithful to you, now I, I claim my blessing and I ask you to open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing. Show me what you're going to do. Show me how I can move into blessings. So just ask him and he'll give you some concepts. Your mind will open up. All right. Another really good way of making money is doing a scam show where you give people scam advice. Dak, this guy is unbelievable, man. He's record-breaking scammer. He really is. Also, you're 80. You're dead broke. Uh, no, no excuses, bitch. Get back to work. Clean out that garage. No, no, no. I know it's you okay. got some shit in there you can sell on eBay. And then send that check to good old Pat Robertson, okay? No, he's... Keep that cash flowing. Keep that tithing going, okay? Uh, you know, there are other ways of making money. Just go to your garage and you'll find some stuff that you can sell on eBay. You got to keep giving money to religion. <laughs> what? Mo She's 80 years old. Stop giving money toward religion. See, m most especially to me. Uh, so it, it, let me give you her quote to, so, so you get a sense of how ruthless this guy is. She explained our old car just broke down. She explained how she'd given over more than 10% throughout their entire lives, right? Then she says, our old car just broke down. We had to borrow money to fix it. We both need dental work, but we can't afford it. I constantly have to use our credit card to pay for medical needs. What could we be doing wrong? First of all, here's what you could be doing wrong, voting Republican. 
<laughs> okay, I mean, at 80, you still need me medical. You got teeth missing and stuff, and they're like, "Oh, goddamn, Obamacare." Now, I don't know if she did that. Okay, but but uh, Pat Robertson ran for president on the Republican ticket. Sports Republicans said so. Now, I, I don't mean to over make it overly political, but that's one of the things. The other thing you're doing wrong is giving more than 10 percent of your income throughout your whole life to scammers like Pat Robertson. And then, of course, you ran out of money. Oh, if you'd you kept it that way, you, you, if you kept the 10%, you wouldn't be out of money or teeth right now. All you got to do is talk to Jesus, and Jesus will give you the answers. Yeah, I that's, love that's, that's, like his, that's his piece of advice. Just ask God what you can do to make more money. And then go to your garage, find shit that you don't need anymore, and then sell it. Put it up on eBay. Jake doesn't even know how to manipulate the apps on his phone. Can you imagine an 80-year-old trying to sell stuff on eBay? I'm not trying to make fun of 80-year-olds. I'm sure there are plenty of computer literate 80-year-olds out there. But okay. it's just not a good piece of advice. And I, I love the ending there. He's like, so just ask, just ask Jesus. I'll do Anna doing Pat Roberts. <laughs> just ask Jesus. Oh, I didn't know it was that simple. Well, I've been asking him for 80 fucking years, and now I got no teeth left. <laughs> okay, my car doesn't run. Yeah. He's like, well, there's plenty of things you can do. I mean, like, maybe sell your body. People are into guilt, porn, that could happen. And then you take the money and you send it to me. God, man. Remember, this is the guy who raised money for helicopters to help people in, in it that were affected by a genocide in Africa, then use the helicopters for his diamond mines. Oh. <laughs> so we're surprised that he's like, well, do you have any gold left in any of your remaining teeth? You can sell those and send them to me. He's a really bad guy. He's a funny bad guy, but he's a bad guy. He is a bad guy, especially when it comes to scamming people out of their money. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. But you know what? Like, that dude will be a scammer to his dying breath. He's going to be, he, and he's never going to leave. You know he's not going to die, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to be like 118 years old. He's going to be like, keep sending the money. You know, I, I had a really good friend who dated a guy for a while who would, he was Mormon. Um, he would give about, Five hundred dollars a month toward his church. Yeah, that's Mormons are. I was about to say religious about that. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> right. Uh, no, no. If you're a Mormon, you got to give ten percent. Those so idiot Steve Young and all those uh, Mormon football players who I loved uh, would take, you know, ten percent of their income was a giant amount of money, and they're like, yeah, psh, go Mormon church. Wow. I wonder if Steve Young wore warm magic underwear during the games. Can I turn myself into a Mormon church? <laughs> I know, right? Uh, hello, welcome to the Young Turks Tabernacle. <laughs> There's an idea. All right, let's move forward. Okay. The, ad the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK has banned two separate American apparel ads because of their voyeuristic nature and because they found the ads to be offensive. Now, for those of you who are familiar with American apparel ads, they are supposed to be racy. They're usually very sexual in nature. That's the reason why people tend to talk about them. Well, the two ads in question uh, were part of a back-to-school campaign that American Apparel put out there, and it features a girl wearing um, a pleated skirt, you know, a schoolgirl skirt, and she's bending over in, and talking to someone into a car, and it seems as though someone takes an upshot, or I'm sorry, upskirt picture of her. Um, you see her butt, you see her panties, there's the picture in question. That's an ad for American Apparel. So uh, the watchdog group basically said, no, these are not okay, we are gonna ban them. They obviously have very different standards when it comes to advertising compared to the United States. Here in the US, it's not really much of a, an issue. You'll see that on a billboard. They're like, wait, could you see her sphincter? No? Okay, good to go. Yeah, which is kind I of mean, amazing. I mean, we've all seen the exact contours of David Beckham's penis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, okay, here's David Beckham in skin-tight underwear. All right, dude, I got it, I got it. Now, like, so this is an interesting issue. Obviously, British law applies, not American law, so it's different, uh, and they can do whatever they want. So I'm not going to get into whether their law makes sense. But it, what, what do we think about this? So there's two let sides me, of it. Let me give you their statements first, All right, go and ahead. then we'll make a ruling, okay? okay? So the watchdog said the image is imitated voyeuristic upskirt shots, which had been taken without the subject's consent, and therefore had the potential to normalize predatory sexual behavior. And from, uh, from the context in which the ads appeared, it was likely that those who viewed them would understand that the model was or was intended to be a schoolgirl. So that was another issue they had with it. Now, American Apparel responded back and said this is ridiculous. 
Willis, the model is 30 years old, but how would you be able to tell that the model's 30 years old when you're looking at nothing but her very, very nice ass? Mm -hmm. You know, in, in an upskirt type of way. Okay, now that you told me that she's 30, in hindsight, I can enjoy this picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so when I mean, that gets to the, to the core issue here. Now, if you do child porn, and, but the woman is above age, mm -hmm. but you say that she's a child, then, you know, that's, every country has different laws about it, but it's certainly circumspect. So it, it's a questionable tactic to use, yes. obviously. Now, in this case, it's not porn. She is clothed, kind of, right? Uh, now, if you're a 15-year-old and you like American Amer Apparel, this is part of why you like them, right? And if she's 15 and you're 15, rock and roll, you love that picture and there's nothing wrong with that, right? But you're doing an ad where also 45-year-olds look at it, 65-year-olds look at it. So... I mean... And they're supposed to be, they're obviously pretending that they're schoolgirls. Yes, they are. Okay, so let me, let me tell you my thoughts on it really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have a problem with overly sexualized advertisements. I think that we do it for men just as often as we do it for uh, women. I love that you brought up the David Beckham thing. I mean, you saw almost everything, right? And mm -hmm. there was nothing wrong with that. And female models do the same thing. Yes. You see them in lingerie, you look at the Victoria's Secret ads, and you know, the boobies and the butt, and like the freaking abs, and everything is exposed. Yes. It is what it is. Like yes. that's sex sells, unfortunately, and it, it catches your attention, it catches your eye, and I, I understand that. In this case, the only thing that kind of raised a red flag to me was the upskirt nature of the picture, right? Because there have been a number of incidents where people would take their smartphones, whether it was on, um, you know, public transit or whether it was, you know, out in the streets, and they would take the upskirt pictures. It's a really, really hideous thing to do to someone, right? And remember, we did a... 28% of the Japanese population is that. Okay. <laughs> That's not true. Yes. <laughs> um, so I can understand why they don't want to endorse or promote that type of behavior in the UK. Mm -hmm. So, considering that aspect of it, I can understand why they did it. Yeah, and, and to me, the critical thing is that they, it's clearly about schoolgirls. Mm -hmm. So, if it was like a upskirt picture, but it's somebody who's like, let's say, a, a professional woman, that still is like really uncomfortable for women, and you don't want to encourage that kind of behavior. Uh, but at least they're adults, right? Then you're doing upskirt of a girl going back to high school. Yeah. That's super creepy, dude. Right? So. They're, you know, look, they're not allowed to do it in Britain. They probably are allowed to do it here. Yep. Uh, you know, I... And then if you ban it, then there's most of the people who wear American Apparel are young, and they're like, what are you banning it for? I'm the one who wears it, and I like it, right? And also, just keep in mind that the CEO of this very same company had to be ousted by the board of directors uh, because of sexual assault uh, charges. Harassment. Yeah. That and he'd bring uh, women into the, his office and beat off. Like, in front of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean... So, the, the company itself has had run-ins and issues with, uh, you know, sexual harassment and stuff like that. And then you have an ad like this, and it just kind of gives you a sense of what the culture is within the company. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to make any judgments on whether it should be allowed or not. But given that it's underage people, it creeps me out a little bit, right? They're, they're, the models are not underage but they're obviously trying to get you to think that the schoolgirl is underage and we're looking at her skirt. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a stretch to say I'm creeped out by it. Fair enough? Yeah, I don't think that's a stretch either. Yes. I'm All proud right. of you. I didn't, <laughs> Thank you. I didn't expect well, that. I'm proud of me for being creeped out about underage titillation. <laughs> wow. Our, our bar is pretty low. So as Bush would say, my, the trick is to keep <laughs> expectations low. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, more news from the UK. Police officers in the UK are now asking some crime victims to do their own investigations. Now, this specifically has to do with uh, car theft or any type of damaged property. And according to reports, including The Independent, householders are being asked by police to look out for potential fingerprint evidence, check for witnesses, and look on secondhand websites for stolen property. They also state a few statistics, including the following. 37 of the 43 forces in England and Wales dealt with some cases over the telephone and closed some without the victim ever even meeting a police officer. So people are alarmed by this because they're like, look, why do we have cops if they're not going to do the investigations? Why should the victim do all the legwork when it comes to these issues? No, I think this is a hilarious story. <laughs> they're like, oh, yeah, um, thanks for calling us. Uh, anyway, can you go ahead and do the investigation yourself? And then I would need you, why? 
<laughs> or perhaps they just play him this. Oh, yeah, leads. You've got leads? Great. Are you going to find these guys? Or, you know, I mean, you got any promising uh, uh, leads or... Leads? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, just check with the boys down at the crime lab. They uh, got uh, four more detectives working on the case. They got us working in shifts. <laughs> Disaster. <Lead. laughs> no, but that's the, the cops in Britain now. Leads. Yeah, they got us working in shifts. How the fuck am I supposed to get the fingerprints? I know. That's crazy. And you're supposed to do the research to see if you can find any of your stolen property at like pawn shops and things like that, which is, <laughs> yeah, it's insane. It, it's insane. But look, by the way, for those living in the UK that are like pointing your fingers at us and saying we're no better, believe me, we know we're no better. I mean, oh. our police are spending all of their time doing like traffic citations, busting people for drugs and all. And then when it comes to real crime, it's like, yeah, 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 let me write a report. And then they don't do anything about it, which, of course, is also happening in the you UK. You know, I've told this uh, story before, but two stories were for, were for me. One time I got robbed in New York, in my apartment in New York, and the guy left his handprint on the window that he lifted up. I'm like, I have, in this case, I got the lead. I have the fingerprints. <laughs> and cops are like, eh, don't worry about it. They will refuse to show up. I'm like, I have the fingerprints. They're like, well, whatever. We'll never catch. Okay. And then another time I got my identity stolen when I lived in Miami, I went down to the cops. He's like, you really want to fill out, bother filling out the form? We're not going to do anything about it. Wow. Okay. It's identity <laughs> theft. Like, that'll ruin your life. Yeah, yeah. No, they're like, Shh. so, Britain, believe me, we feel your pain. Yes. Um, so a, a statement from uh, a, an inspector who's really outraged about all of this. I think that he hits the nail on the head. He says, they're the cops, and we expect the cops to catch people. Unless you've got the powers of Mystic Meg or something like that, you, you not turning up and using your skills, it's not going to be mighty, mightily difficult to bring people to justice, or it's going to be difficult to bring people to justice, which is absolutely right. So if people know that the cops aren't actually going to investigate these thefts and, these, and cases of property crime, then they're going to go around doing whatever the hell they want without well, any type of consequences. Well, that's the thing. Now uh, you've got a vicious cycle. Yeah. Because now they won't decriminalize drugs, right? But in essence, what this article is saying in The Independent is that they have almost decriminalized criminal damage and stolen vehicles. They're not showing up for stolen vehicles. You know what that means? Open season, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You go steal any car they want. you want, you know the cops aren't even going to bother to investigate. That's going to encourage more stolen cars. So And then they'll never be able to keep up. It's a terrible cycle. And besides which, that's what we pay you for, to be cops and to do investigations and to make sure you prevent crime. It's like you call the fire department and they're like, so anyway, you got some water around there? Yeah. You might want to sprinkle that around the house. No, dude, you're the fire department. Show up with a big hose. By the way, I should give the perspective of the police officers. They're saying that funds have been cut to their departments. They don't have the resources that they used to have to investigate these crimes. But that's no excuse. I mean, you got to prioritize, right? I would argue that there are some things that they prioritize over property crime or theft and things like that. You, you, can't, you can't do that. You can't have people going around stealing things. Well, two quick things about that. One... Look, you know, I mean, this story I did in the first hour, said, you know cops are... I'm not saying cops are more lazy than other people. I'm just saying they're just as lazy as any human being, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of the issue here. You get a bureaucracy and the guy doesn't want to get off of his fat ass. But yes, it's also true that the uh, bigger problem is lack of funding. Well, that's why that's a, it's an issue that you should take up with your government, right? And yes, if they cared more about us, they'd put more into uh, police forces and make sure that they serve the community. A lot of times they don't. Look, here in, in Newark, they ran out of toilet paper. They, they fired like 40% yes. of the cops. In Detroit, they fired a lot of the cops. And then what happened? Crime, Crime skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Camden, too. Hmm. What what's, uh, unites Camden, Newark, and Detroit? Weird, largely African-American uh, cities uh, that were left to fend for themselves in states where they had plenty of white cities that had perfectly funded cops. Interesting how that works. So believe me, we've got our own problems. All right, next. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I, I cut out the sad stories. We're doing a few more fun stories. Yes. And then we're freaking calling it a night. Okay? That's okay. what we're going to do. All right, and Stick the bar dance. You liked that, didn't you? Mm. 
<laughs> All right. If you want the whole show, you like it even more, go to tytnetwork.com. Go under Member Options, and you can get the whole show anytime you like.